Storm in an espresso cup, or is it serious? For the first time since Italy declared war on France in 1940, Paris has recalled its ambassador for consultations. The French denounced, quote, outrageous statements and unprecedented attacks. Part of a war of words that began last June, shortly after the formation of a populist coalition in Rome, migration, France's role in Libya and Africa, EU budgetary rules, the list of differences runs long. The last straw, though, seems to be the five-star movement leader's boast on social media that he met this Tuesday south of Paris with French yellow vests with an eye towards eventual, an eventual alliance in next May's European elections. Luigi Di Maio, who also opposes the Lyon-Turin train rail pro tunnel project, but is this a crisis of Emmanuel Macron's own making? In a speech before both houses of the French parliament back in July, the French president described Europe's political fault lines as a battle of progressives versus nationalists, a clear reference to Italy, after earlier warning of a, quote, rising leprosy in Europe. How far will this route go? What impact will this trans-alpine tiff have on the rest of the continent when citizens vote for a new EU parliament come the month of May? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at uh, that spiraling row between Rome and Paris. With us from Brussels, Ignazo Corrao, member of the European Parliament for the Five Star Movement. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. From Strasbourg, Olivier Costa, director of the Department of European Politics and Administration at the College of Europe. Welcome to the show. Good evening. From Rome, Christian Blasberg teaches contemporary history at Luis Guido Carli University. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. And just back from the Foreign Ministry, France 24's very own Philip Toro. How are you? Hi, Francois. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. I don't want conflicts with anyone. That's what Italy's other deputy prime minister, Matteo Salvini from the far right League party said. Salvini, who back in January called Emmanuel Macron a terrible president. All this after Paris recalled its ambassador for consultations. James Fazina has more. After months of escalating tensions, France is now recalling its ambassador to Italy for talks. Earlier this week, Italy's deputy prime minister Luigi Di Maio met with yellow vest protesters outside Paris, saying he would be ready to help the anti-government movement and invited them for a follow-up meeting in Rome. After a series of provocations, this move proved to be the last straw for the French government. This new provocation is unacceptable between neighbouring countries and partners at the heart of the European Union. In the interests of both France and Italy, Mr Di Maio, who has governmental responsibilities, should take care not to undermine our bilateral relations through his repeated interferences. Interior Minister Matteo Salvini responded that he didn't want to cause an argument and that he would willingly meet with French President Emmanuel Macron. But De Maio had previously called on the EU to impose sanctions on Paris for pushing migrants into Europe by continuing to, quote, colonize Africa. This prompted France to summon Italy's ambassador. Matteo Salvini then poured fuel on the fire, calling on the French to boycott President Macron's party in the European parliamentary elections. I hope the French people will be able to free themselves from a very bad president. The French people will choose, I hope, on May 26, somebody more representative, more trustworthy, more consistent, more practical. I'm thinking of Marine Le Pen. The French foreign ministry then hit back, saying these unfounded statements should be read in the context of domestic Italian politics. They are unacceptable. Di Maio and Salvini have previously voiced support for the Yellow Vest anti-Macron protesters. This is just the latest episode in a war of words between neighbours, since Italy's anti-establishment five-star movement and far-right league won power last year. Back in June, the two countries clashed when France criticised Italy's decision to turn away the Aquarius, a rescue ship carrying 629 people, as Salvini went on to systematically block the country's port to migrants. Now, just to be clear, Philip Turrell, that statement that was put out by the French Foreign Ministry never explicitly mentions the yellow vest, but it, they do does say at one point, quote, the campaign for the European elections cannot justify the lack of respect for each people or for their democracy. 
Well, basically what they're saying is that France is going to fight the European elections with its own candidates. Italy is going to field candidates from its side. But Italy should not come over the border and try to instrumentalise what's going on in France and say what it thinks France should be doing. And that's basically the bottom line when it comes to why this quarrel has broken out. And as you said before, the... Uh, if you like, the, uh, the the straw that broke the camel's back was this meeting uh, just with uh, two of the Yellow Vest uh, uh, leaders uh, last week uh, with the uh, Italian Deputy Prime Minister, which France says is totally unacceptable, and um, they should not be coming into France and saying what they think France should be doing. But we have uh, leaders from different countries who regularly go to other countries to campaign for candidates who are of the same political affiliation. Well, they do, but I don't have any recollection of anybody in Europe actually saying that the president or the prime minister of a neighbouring country in Europe, a European neighbour within the European Union, is a bad president or a bad prime minister or that they should not be running the country or that somebody else, in the case of France, Emmanuel Macron, should be replaced by Marine Le Pen. I think that the, uh, the French government... Uh, doesn't take that kind of remark too lightly. And that explains why we've got this unprecedented situation today. I mean, it has to be said, this is the worst crisis between Italy and France since the Second World War, since 1940. So it has to be said that there, there is um, uh, a, a, a proof here that uh, the... Uh, relationship between uh, Italy and France is on downward spiral, and I think we've reached the lowest point today. Uh, Ignazio Corral, that, that remark about France having a bad present, that didn't come from the leader of your party. That came from, from Matteo Salvini. But uh, Luigi Di Maio did say on social media, the winds of change have crossed the Alps. I repeat, the winds of change have crossed uh, the Alps. Uh, did he go t too far going to, uh, the, to the town of Montargis to meet with those yellow vests? But absolutely, absolutely not, because Luigi Di Maio was not speaking as deputy prime minister. He was speaking as the leader of the Five Star Movement. Remember, I, I want to remember everyone that Luigi Di Maio is also the leader of the Five Star Movement at the meeting. The picture that you showed, I was I was in there. I was present at that meeting. It was a normal, regular meeting that all political movements, all political parties do across Europe in order to find affiliation, to talk about programs, ideas, in order to see if there are chances to run together for the next European election. I mean, there is nothing strange. It's the same thing when Macron speaks with Renzi, which is our opposition in Italy. So I think that the, uh, the president of the French Republic just overreacted in this case, withdrawing the ambassador, because probably, probably is a little touchy in this moment, is too uh, sensitive. Because if we go to uh, the way that the word they, the, the word used, probably uh, yes, Salvini used strong word, but uh, but less, <laughs> I mean, softer, softer than the words that Macron used uh, against Italy when he referred to uh, leprosy, no populism, uh, populist leprosy, or when he referred to the Italian government, say that Italy. Deserved, lead, deserves leader up to the job, and there, there were also, you know, offensive words from the from the government of French, and we didn't withdraw the ambassador. So I think it just overreacted. And I, I, I want to remember that we really respect French people. We consider not only our neighbors but our cousins. So it's like a fight in family, a fight between neighbors, between right. friends. All right, a family row, if you will. Uh, Olivier Costa, you agree that uh, Emmanuel Macron perhaps being a little oversensitive? Yes, I think... But, but I'm putting the question to Olivier, Olivier Costa. Yeah. Um, there is a bit of distortion of the reality here, considering that the Gilets Jaunes are just political opponent to Emmanuel Macron, just an average political party as one other. And the comparison between the Gilets Jaunes and the Democratic Party in Italy is just totally pointless. The Gilets Jaunes have been demonstrating now for 12 weeks in the streets of the main uh, uh, towns in France, destroying everything, fighting with the police, having very violent things, asking for the resignation of the president, the change of, of institution, etc., etc. It is not a political party of today, so they are thinking about applying and going running for a European election, but now it's a social movement, and it's a bit different when 
the minister of a country goes in another country to support a social movement who's fighting with police every, every Saturday. So I wouldn't consider that President Macron has gone too far because there's been one attack each week in the in last two months from oh, no. Italian leaders that in a way are trying to distract the public opinion from their bad economic results. Uh, the figures for growth have just been published by the commission yesterday and Italy is at the bottom of the list. So there is no plan on the Italian government regarding the economic situation on Italy. They're just looking forward to European election and they just try to polarize the election in a way creating but, two camps, them, oh, no. the Liga and Eurosceptic uh, uh, parties against Macron, who's in it's a way the, the leader of the pro-European parties. Ignazio Corral? No, absolutely. This is an acceptable analysis because who, who, who follows the uh, the work of the Five Star Movement in the European Parliament perfectly knows that the Five, the five Star Movement has been working for a better Europe, not to destroy the European project, but to build a better one. This is what we are doing. And it's not true that we went to France to meet a violent part of the protest in France. This is a completely untrue. We met a part that is called RIC, is relevant for the initiative of Citoyenne, that want to make a list for the European election. They have nothing to do with violence and with uh, act of uh, act of aggression against the government. They have broader, they have things that don't they don't like that of the French government, and they're building a new proposal. And the Five Star Movement was born ten years ago on the same basis, from protests, from the streets, from uh, uh, from uh, normal, regular people that create an opposition to a system that didn't work. So we just met to have a confrontation on the basis that on the basis of their programs and ideas. There's nothing to do with violence and nothing to do with respecting a, a legitimate government that, of course, we have to respect. But of course, we have to build our political pro proposal for Europe. So nothing strange. And I think that Macron is his domestic problem, and he should talk to the French people, to his people, not find an enemy in Italy in order to have a reason to build this electoral campaign for you for the European election. Okay, so Christian Blasberg, you, you heard uh, Ignazio Corral saying that uh, the French president has domestic problems and therefore this is a, 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 a convenient distraction. You heard Olivier Costa saying the, the Italian government has problems domestically and therefore it's a convenient distraction. What do you make of all of this? Well, what I believe actually is that the Five Star Movement in Italy is uh, in this period a little bit under pressure. They have uh, two problems. One is that they are losing consensus in Italy uh, in favor of the League. The League has been uh, the, the real winner of the elections. It has been less strong than the Five Star Movement in the elections themselves, but then gained a lot of popularity and doubled its, uh, its uh, share in this moment. The second problem of the Five Star Movement is that there is in whole Europe not any comparable other movement. While the League, for example, has in France and in also in other countries uh, a partner. It has the Rassemblement National in France, it has uh, AFD in Germany and uh, several other movements across Europe and can build on uh, this uh, alliance of, of parties. While the Five Star Movement does not find any partner of the same inspiration, the same kind in other countries. They have seen now that in France there is a popular movement, and here I have to uh, say the, uh, the, the deputy of the Five Star Movement uh, is right when he sees that there is a parallelism in uh, the way how the two movements starts. What starts today in France has started 10 years ago in Italy in a kind of similar way. So it is kind of normal that the Five Star Movement tries to uh, find some kind of connection to that movement and um, see if there is some kind of intention, some kind of agreement uh, yeah, are with they, that are movement. They, are it's they? The are they? Country, let me France. just let me just yes. ask you about this. Are they? Are they uh, likely bedfellows? Because uh, the the Yellow Vest movement in this country, from uh, from what we've gathered, there is no scientific survey about it. It's a mostly leaderless movement. One third of the people you might say are closer to the far left, one third closer to the far right, and one third uh, apolitical. That's how uh, our reporters who've been going out every, every weekend describe it. Uh, are they really close to the five star ideologically? Well, um, I have to say I'm not French, so I'm, I don't know. But as far as I can see, this movement is very 
uh, undefined yet. And also the five stars 10 years ago had been very undefined. One didn't know what the five stars actually were. Were they left wing? Were they right wing? Were they uh, kind of uh, fundamental <laughs> process? It was not clear. They defined their position over the years. The Yellow West in this moment are completely unheterogeneous. Say we don't know actually who is behind. It's simply a popular movement. It's simply a movement where many citizens who are unsatisfied for various reasons are going on the streets and joining this movement. And uh, it has to come out what kind of movement actually they are. This is not clear yet. Of course, trying to link with this uh, Yellow West movement means that the Five Star Movement is trying to define it, trying to give it a profile and draw it to its own side. If they will succeed in this operation is totally unclear. We have seen also from the Yellow West movement, for example, very critical voices of these meetings uh, with representatives of the Five Star Movement. So uh, this is all to be seen. But it is an operation which has to be seen in the, the perspective of the upcoming uh, elections, the European elections, and it is a, an electoral campaign uh, operation which is taking place in these uh, days, in these uh, weeks. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, when we see if there is a list of the Yellow West movement for the European elections, if it has some success, if it has a program, if it defines itself in some way, then only we can see in a few months what is actually the real substance of this movement. This is not clear at all in this moment. It, it gathers a lot of very different, very um, various uh, kinds of protests mm -hmm. in the French population. Olivier Costa, you agree? Yeah, totally. It's it's really a, a movement which is made of many different things, people from all kind of political uh, uh, directions. And they're and not all violent. They, 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 they gather against an idea of rejection of the current political system and the current political leaders. Some of them are violent, some are not. And, and it's really mixed. And the real challenge for that movement now about after 12 weekends of demonstration is to try to structure itself. And the problem is that the movement does not have really a leader. And this is a major difference with the Five Star Movement because the Five Star Movement was in a way initiated by Beppe Grillo. And there is no Beppe Grillo until now in France. And so the various leaders of the movement are a bit lost when it comes for the next steps and especially to go and run for European election. And that's why also they would need the support of, of a movement like the Five, five Star Movement was more resources and was clearly looking for partners in France. Philip Terrell, this is not just about, uh, right now the row is between uh, Luigi Di Maio and, and Emmanuel Macron after Di Maio's visit to uh, Montargis, south of, south of Paris. But most of the rowing since this coalition came to power last uh, year has been uh, with Matteo Salvini, the leader of uh, the far-right league, most notably with the French and the Italians trading barbs over the issue of how to handle uh, immigrants and illegal uh, illegal uh, migrants and refugees. Well, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, Matteo Salvini has based his uh, platform on an anti-immigrant uh, stance, um, and that's what he wants to for Italy, uh, saying as part of his uh, election campaign, he wanted to kick uh, immigrants out of the country. Uh, France has criticised the way Italy handles the migrant situation, particularly refusing to let uh, ships dock in Italy to let migrants off and uh, sending them back out into the Mediterranean to find another country which, which will agree to take them. Um, and also Italy has started criticising France because it says that when migrants come over the border in the southeast of France, uh, into France, um, France will then send them back to Italy. Uh, France has replied... Which is that, true. Which is true, but France has replied that under EU rules... If a migrant comes into a country illegally, it's in the country where he arrives that he has to uh, apply for um, asylum. And therefore, if they come in from Italy to France, they have to go back to Italy and it's there that they must make that demand. Uh, if they come to France, however, then they can make the demand in France, but it has to be France when they arrive first. Italy has been saying, well, that's just proof that we don't want migrants, but France doesn't want them either. But France is not being honest about it, whereas we are. All right, migrants, the uh, argument over the yellow vests, that's not all. There's more to uh, this feud within the family across the Alps. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome. If you're just joining us, it's the France 24 debate and we're discussing a unprecedented row between uh, France and Italy, two founding members of what is now the European Union, 
uh, to neighbors who are seen that row with the French recalling for consultations their ambassador to Rome. With us to talk about it from Brussels, Ignazio Corrao, member of the European Parliament for the Five Star Movement. Welcome back as well from Strasbourg. Olivier Costa, director of uh, the Department of European Politics and Administrations at the uh, Collège de l'Europe, the College of Europe. He is in Strasbourg. Then welcome back to you. From Rome, Christian Blasberg, who teaches contemporary history at Lius, uh, Guido Carli University, and France 24's very own Philip Turrell. Uh, yeah, the, the row uh, between the two nations extends beyond the yellow vest, beyond the migrant crisis. It also is about business interests, arguments over what to do about Libya. And then there's the fresh row over the long-planned, off-delayed tunnel from Lyon to Turin through the Alps. The uh, digging to alleviate increasing uh, truck traffic on mountain roads and an existing rail line that is antiquated. Italian newspaper La Stampa reported earlier this week on a leaked audit of the project that claims it'll cost 7 billion euros more than it would make over a 50-year period. The five-star infrastructure minister stating nobody should dare to sign off on advancing this line. We would consider this uh, a hostile act. He hails from Luigi Di Maio's party, the same Luigi Di Maio who opposes the Lyon-Turin high-speed rail tunnel, by the way, also pushing for a Hyperloop train through uh, his uh, stronghold of Sicily. Every morning I wake up and I think how it's, uh, uh, g how it's faster to go from Palermo to Catania flying through Rome, he is quoted as saying on the website of Palermo today. Um, so, Ignazio Corral, this issue of the uh, Lyon-Turin uh, rail line, uh, you have Di Maio against that, but in favor of a hyperloop in Sicily. Why is that? But I, Di Maio is absolutely right. Actually, I am from Sicily, so I cannot be more agreeing with him. You have to think that to connect you know, two of the biggest cities of Italy, like Palermo and Catania, you really have old and, uh, and broken infrastructure. So, And uh, to dig a tunnel of 60 kilometers in order to have a train that bring goods for for 20 minutes less the time that uh, it's required now, I think is not a priority for it's, Italy. It's not the 20 minutes. It's going to cut the time in half. Uh, it's four hours to two hours is the idea. No, no, it's 20 minutes less. This is what the cost benefits analysis says. So we think it's not a priority for Italy to have this kind of infrastructure. Of course, if we first do the infrastructures that are required, then we can think about this. But so, this is a project of 30 years ago. Can I do an example? We have the uh, European capital of culture, Matera, that is not connected by train with the capital of Italy, Rome. We have all the infrastructure in all the, uh, in all the islands. We have Sardinia without an highway. We have uh, places or Italy that are totally disconnected. But it, it just so happens, people. it just so happens, Ignazio, that the uh, political base of Di Maio is in Sicily and uh, the political base for uh, Matteo Salvini is in the north. He's in favor of the Lyon-Turin project. So is this a, not a really. domestic problem? No, no, it's not really like this. You have to think that the major of Turin is from the Five Star Movement, and one of and the no tab, so the movement against the this train was based in Piedmont. We have, we are, we are a movement which is represented in all regions of Italy. We are not a regional movement like League is. So this is not the point. The point is, is there is a part of the establishment in Italy who make pressure for this infrastructure because it's a lot of money that could be spent. And when in Italy there are a lot of money to be spent, normally there are some someone who's really interested on in putting their hand on it. So we are pretty we are pretty uh, careful on investing that money on the priority our country have. And the priority our country have are not this, is not this train, but are the infrastru infrastructure that connect people and make people and make life better for the Italian people. Then we can think about other things. All right, the French government doesn't see it that way. They, they see it as a domestic row between Italian coalition partners. Let's listen to the government spokesperson. 
In principle, we will never do what Mr. Salvini and Mr. Di Maio expect from us, spend all our time commenting on their remarks. What I can say, it is a project that has been in the works for some time. It is an important project for both our countries, equally for quality of commercial exchanges as quality of our connection. Uh, Christian Blasberg, you, you agree with uh, Benjamin Griveaux or with uh, Ignacio Corral? Me and me? Yes. Um, well, uh, I believe that uh, these kind of trains uh, surely are made also in other parts of Europe, so um, I'm not, uh, let's say, completely against um, uh, the, the tough project, even though, of course, the arguments that the Five Star Movement has brought forth are not to be completely ignored. So one has to discuss about these things. And I believe that um, some kind of solution in the very end has to be, uh, to be found on this. And the two parts should uh, come together. The two countries should come together. Is it a domestic um, issue? Is it an see, Italian uh, this, issue? Or, yes. is it, or is it a Franco-Italian issue, this, this, this row over whether or not to build this rail tunnel? Well, I believe that in this moment, of course, when we uh, connected with uh, the, uh, the interventions and the various uh, uh, clashes between France and Italy in this moment, this is one of the issues where you can play on. Um, I believe that once the elections are over, uh, the whole thing will not be debated as, as uh, hot as it is now. So uh, it is also in this case uh, for sure a, a matter of, of electoral campaign to play uh, very much on this card. So to, to individuate as, as, um, in a certain sense France as a country which has a very weak political uh, establishment where the president is under pressure, where uh, radical forces are on the street and are in parliaments and where, let's say, something can be gained, something can be done. And so one takes whatever kind of issue, if it is Libya, if it's the tough, if it is uh, any other thing, if it's the migrant question, um, you take whatever issue in order to uh, try and, uh, and, and uh, underline this kind of opposition and um, try to, to stabilize somehow the French political system. This is, uh, let's say, an operation which is a political operation, but I believe it is just due to electoral campaign. It is almost normal, I would say, for electoral campaigns. And we will see that once the electoral campaign is over, uh, the tones will uh, for sure um, calm down somehow. I'm now, critics, sure critics of the French president would say that the electoral campaign started early on this side of the Alps. Uh, it was July before a joint session of France's parliament and the Senate at Versailles that the president seemed to be laying the fault lines for next May's European elections. It must also be said clearly, the real border across Europe today is the one separating the progressives from the nationalists. The progressives from the nationalists, and everybody understood that when he made those remarks, Philip Turrell, as being directed at the likes of Italy? Well, that, you have to look at it this way. You have to look at it, the fact that Angela Merkel, who is uh, Macron's main ally in Europe, is on the way out. Macron is beginning to feel a little bit more isolated as the main pro-European, pro-EU president who is trying to fight off a lot of populism, be it in Italy, be it the Brexit campaign in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom, being what's going on in Hungary or certain East European countries, feeling, I think, more and more isolated and saying, I'm like the bastion now who's going to stand up for Europe. We don't even know what's going to happen uh, in Germany afterwards. So um, I think it's th that, that's the main issue. That's why Macron is, or Macron's troops are fighting back against this. And I think there's another issue in all this as well, and that is that within Italy itself, as we've been saying, there's some infighting going on between the Five Star Movement and uh, its, uh, its rival over who is going to command its the majority and, and for, for the European election campaign, which is coming up on the, uh, the 26th of May. So on one side, they want to uh, get Marine Le Pen on board to make this greater European far-right populist movement. And on the other side, Luigi Di Maio wants to cash in on the Yellow Vest movement, as we've been saying, so that he has some support. All right, that, that's over in Italy. Olivier Costa, is this a crisis of Emmanuel Macron's own making? Is he feeling a boomerang effect? After all, it was Macron back last June who initially made that comment about a rising leprosy in Europe. 
I'm not sure that the comment was really directed towards Italy. I think it's quite an objective view on the current situation of European integration with a growing number of countries expressing quite nationalist view and, and, a, and a, a reducing number of countries who are strictly supporting the EU as it is. And it's true that Macron feels a bit isolated in, in, that, in that story. And he really wants to frame your, the next European election as a fight between people who want Europe as it is, or more Europe, and those who are less Europe, or to want to, to dismantle and Europe. He's, so and he's, and he's again, he's the one who decided to frame it like that. Yeah, clearly, clearly, he he wanted to be the hero of more European integration because he has been elected on that topic. Everybody told him not to to present himself as a pro-European. He did it, and he won the election. And uh, when you when you look now at, at what's going on, if you were cynical, Olivier Costa, would you say that uh, this is a win-win situation for both sides? You you heard uh, uh, Christian Blasberg describe uh, this as politicking. Um, is it going to be a vote getter for both Macron and for uh, those uh, that are in the populist coalition over in Italy? No, I think it's a very dangerous game because it's not about a conflict between Finland and Malta. It's a conflict between France and Italy. Uh, Italy is a second uh, economic partner for France. It's really a crucial relation and and you cannot just damage that relation for electoral concerns. And I, I had the feeling that the Italian leaders just after Macron has called back the, the ambassador has, have tried to calm down the whole thing, saying that we are ready for a discussion, etc., etc. So uh, I think that everybody is very concerned about that and nobody has nothing to win in such a situation because it could have a lot of economic and political consequences. Ignazio Corral, how far could it go? Well, I think it won't go far. They think that, uh, I mean, I, I told you I told you before, I mean, we, we have lots of respect for the French people, the French government, and we will find a solution. But something has to be clear. Emmanuel Macron, you were saying, you know, he's a hero of a new Europe, Europeism. And uh, the way he's doing the, the hero is like b bringing migrants to, uh, to the other side of the frontier to Italy. So the, the things that we've seen in Bardonecchia. What, what, what we see is, is that many times our cousins, you know, the, the French that we love and we want to work together, are bullying, you know, the, the younger cousins in Italy. So what we are asking now is just a little of respect, because I understand Macron doesn't want anyone to interfere with domestic affairs in France, but Macron is always interfering with domestic affairs of the others. So if we go with double standards, with double standards, of course, it can be a difficult situation. But if we go with the idea of respecting each other in the same way, and we ask the French government to do so, we absolutely are on the on the position of cooperating, working together, because we are absolutely aware that the European project has to go on and we have to work and cooperate with France. And the Five Star Movement, which is the ma majority part of the Italian government, is absolutely pro-European and is working to create a better Europe, a Europe that doesn't think about the financial powers, the banking system and the multinational corporation, as Macron does, but thinks about the social problems problems of European citizens of all the 27, 28 states. This is our aim and this is what we are trying to do across Europe. So, of course, we want to work with them. Uh, Christian Blasberg, you agree that uh, the Five Star Movement is a pro-EU party? We are. Uh, we are well, here. there have been different voices on this, but what I believe is actually that uh, what the Five Star Movement and uh, in general many or all populist movements in Europe are trying to do is to create an alternative Europe. So to appeal to different players, because when you see Macron, Merkel, the access Macron, Merkel and all the other heads of state around who all agree with them, then you have of course only one way how Europe can go. And what the, the populist uh, movements are saying is, well, there is not only this one way how Europe can go, there can be also a different Europe. And this is what actually also the, the colleague from uh, the parliamentarian has been saying. Um, yes, the, we want to, to care for different problems uh, in Europe, problems that those who believe that 
uh, the European project ha is without alternative, are not tackling. They are not tackling the social question. They are not tackling the social problems of many people in, in many European countries. And they want to create an alternative project, which means, in the very end, creating an, a democratic alternative, which means that uh, people should decide, do we want uh, the Europe of those who care, um, who pretend to care, then we have to see if they do it, to care more for the social problems, or do we want to, uh, this, those Europeans who have been running the European project with, well, pretty much success, we have to say, over the last uh, decades. So creating alternative, democratizing Europe, this is the project, but not completely abolishing uh, Europe. This is uh, the way. Of course, the methods can be discussed because there's much provocation in the way how they try to do this. And uh, one could also say, OK, uh, maybe we adopt a different method. We engage in a serious di a dialogue without uh, using these kind of uh, confrontations uh, as, as it has happened now with the, with the French government. But basically, the operation can be seen uh, since many times. Let's just uh, remember the question about the Italian budget last, uh, last autumn. Uh, Italy proposed a budget which was not within the, uh, the criteria of Europe, but it was trying to, uh, to push Europe to accept such a bu budget, to provoke it a little bit, and to say, look, we can also live with this budget. If this is then sensible or not is a different question, but in any case, it is the attempt to create an alternative within Europe, as far as I see it. This is the five-star movement position. I don't know very much for the League position. The League has very different uh, attitudes, and there have been many more voices that talk about uh, getting out of Europe, uh, Italy exit, Frexit, and things like this. Um, so I believe that um, we have to distinguish between the two uh, parts that are at, at, at the basis. But in any case, I believe that the Five Star Movement is not to be called a completely anti-European movement, but it's using methods in order, methods, well, discussable methods a in different, order to a, a different uh, take, if you create will. an alternative Europe. A, diff a different yeah. take. Uh, Olivier Costa, let me just ask you, uh, you heard earlier Ignacio Corral talk about uh, the, the complaining about the bullying tactics at times uh, of the French. Emmanuel Macron has been playing up uh, these past months, uh, the the Paris-Berlin axis. We're about to see uh, the UK leave the European Union. That axis can only get stronger with no uh, British counterbalance. Uh, should Macron be worrying about that and perhaps out of this crisis uh, approach Italy and countries like it in a different way? Sure. I mean, the situation has changed so much in, in, in something like 18 months. 18 months when Macron was elected, again, he presented himself as the hero of more European integration. And everybody thought that he would be able to lead, to lead kind of a league of pro-Europeans, but he's alone. He's alone. Miss Merkel is in quite a difficult situation. Then there is the, the, the Brexit, now the bad relationship with, with Italy. And basically, Macron does not have met so many partners uh, at European level. So I guess that he will have no other choice than start talking again to, uh, to everybody and maybe reducing a bit his ambition regarding more European integration. His power, in a way, you say he's alone, but at the same time, he, uh, the, with the UK leaving, France becomes an even <laughs> more central player. Again, how does he not give that uh, uh, impression of being, as, as, and I'll use Ignazio's word, bullying? Yeah, that's true. That is a difficult situation because I guess that the, 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 the reaction of the Gilets jaunes against Macron a bit similar to, to the feeling some people have about Macron in the rest of Europe. The idea that maybe he's a bit of a confident, not always very subtle in, in the way of expressing uh, himself. And then people maybe appreciate on the one hand his energy and his capacity to, to, to propose and to make things move. But on the other hand, he's so French with that part of arrogance and selfishness, etc., etc. And I, I think some learning is also needed on that side if he wants to be able to rebuild something with his partner at European level in times where the Franco-German relation is a bit difficult. And at the end of the day, uh, Philip, how is this going to, is this all going to just blow over once those European elections have passed? Well, the, the, the bottom line, Francois, is that Italy is not going to go away and neither is France. And there's going to have to be some kind of leeway between the two countries for them, them to get back together to negotiate because having a standoff is all fine, but at the end, there's going to have to be a solution. So France can recall its ambassador and maybe 
go a bit further in its uh, protest to Italy. Uh, but I think this is going to have to come to an end once, hopefully before the European elections, but it will certainly have to come to an end after the European elections. And there'll have to be some common ground where both sides can meet together to discuss things and find a way forward. I think that this is obviously all has its catalyst over candidates being fielded for the European elections. Obviously, the, the, the two movements in Italy want to, to come out of this strongly. They would like also to, to, to join forces, well, certainly the League, with, with, uh, with Marine Le Pen. Uh, Marine Le Pen, who is in a very strong position here in France as well, as far as her support base is concerned. And obviously, that makes for jealous eyes from overseas who would like to uh, get together with her, maybe to, to make a much stronger European populist force. All right, and that, that certainly she's a, she is a, a, alongside uh, Matteo Salvini in the same voting bloc in the European Parliament. Philip Turrell, I want to thank you uh, for joining us. I want to thank as well Ignacio Corral for being with us uh, from Brussels. Olivier Costa thank in Strasbourg. You. Christian Blasberg uh, with us from Rome. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. Enter James Creedon. Hi, Francois. Lots of talk about this on social media. Uh, I think there's been quite a degree of shock that it's come to this. And uh, I'll just start with this tweet uh, by James McCauley pointing out, as many have, that this hasn't happened since 1940. Mussolini was in power. It's one step ahead of breaking diplomatic relations. It's a pretty uh, big step indeed. This is the letter in question where... Uh, uh, the, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs essentially with, uh, with recalls the ambassador that's, that's been circulating online as well. France's official uh, diplomatic um, Twitter account, which is very carefully thought through, unlike Twitter accounts of other uh, some politicians around the world. But this is this the, the, all of these words would have been carefully weighed up because this is essentially um, including this, the little pictograms with the flags. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so France has for several months now been the object of repeated accusations, baseless attacks, uh, outrageous statements. Uh, uh, that that uh, so in in other words, it sounds like almost a couple's tiff. Really, you can imagine one being kicked out for a few nights or something like that. And it goes on then to, to measure things a little bit by saying uh, France appeals to Italy to act in such a way that we can we can get back to our friendly, uh, mutually respectful relationship uh, that, uh, that, uh, that um, at the, I suppose, that is a proper reflection of our common destiny and indeed our history. Uh, in any case, uh, there have been accusations back and you see that some people have been replying, yeah. well, actually, France has been, uh, you know, uh, accusing Italy of behaving in this way or that way or the other way. Well, is it not also the other way around? Refusing to let migrant ships dock. And, exactly. Yeah. And uh, this is a headline that points to, uh, uh, well, this is, this is it in English, essentially. Fr Francis Macron warns of populism as a leprosy. Now, Italy took that as a direct uh, insult. This is going back to May. I think it's May of... Uh, June. June, rather, of last mm. uh, year. So... It's been going on really uh, since uh, the, the, the the new Italian government came in. Italy demands an apology for France. Migrant, you can see all of these headlines going back and forth. That this is just last month. Matteo Salvini accuses France of stealing Africa's wealth. In any case, uh, uh, this is the most recent provocation that brought it to this point uh, when uh, Prime Minister, Five Star Prime Minister Luigi Di Mao met with representatives of uh, Les Gilets Jaunes and he said the winds of change are crossing the Alps. So you could, you could certainly argue that it is uh, provocative. Others saying, meanwhile, dot, 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 three months ahead of European elections, uh, that is, of course, uh, the League's Matteo Salvini. And yeah, and the, the, that, those posters, I've seen them up since Christmas, and they're basically saying everywhere in Europe our ideas are taking hold. Right. Uh, Matt, uh, so there's been a lot, a, lot of, a lot of this kind of stuff. This is Marco Di Mao, not to be confused with the Prime Minister Luigi Di Mao. You can see here with his little European emoji up on top that he's very much pro-Europe as it's currently uh, managed. He's critical of the Prime Minister, saying that foreign policy is not a game, that Salvini and Di Mao should not be uh, playing political football with this. Uh, they're playing with fire, and the price will be paid by the Italian people for this. So that's a comment from a mm. centrist MP. This is an interesting one. It's a, a perspective from uh, Toussaint Alain, who is a former advisor to Ivory Coast, Laurent Bagbo. He said, if African countries recall their ambassador every time there was an outrageous statement, the European Union would be empty of its brave diplomats. Uh, and he goes on to kind of give some examples. In other words, uh, perhaps he feels that Africa would have similar grounds on occasion, but they don't well, do it. He's tying it to, to keep... Venezuela, I see, because Italy has distanced itself from the main uh, bloc of countries uh, which are siding against... Um uh, the uh, are siding against uh, President Nicolas right. Maduro. Although there's a split within the Italian 
cabinet on that too. That's right. Yeah. Unity seems to be hard to find these days. Right. One slightly uh, funny note, this is ITV, uh, the UK's ITV correspondent in Rome, James Mathis. As an aside, Italian news is full of talk about jilly jallies. Lovely name for them, but it uh, does make it hard to take the issue as seriously as it deserves. That is, of course, Gile Gialli, uh, the Italian... Uh, Gile Jaune. The Italian the for Gile Jaune, for yellow vests, indeed. So I suppose to, to Anglo ears, Anglophone ears, Gile Gialli sounds a bit odd. Uh, but in any case, it is a very serious issue, as he points out. Uh, so it, lots of coverage uh, across uh, different uh, different European media as well. The, for the for uh, for uh, the the Guardian, they, they see this as absolutely extraordinary, unpre- almost unprecedented. Uh, you can see headlines across uh, the Italian uh, press. This has been really dominating news coverage uh, in in the Italian media. Uh, all day, essentially. Uh, the, one of the more recent elements uh, that the Corriere Internazionale has been putting up, a uh, French uh, website that keeps track of international uh, uh, news. Uh, Matteo Salvini, uh, or Luigi, Luigi Di Mauro, the Prime Minister, did react on Facebook defending himself, saying the French people are our friends and our allies, uh, but uh, essentially defending the, his decision to meet with the Gilets Jaunes, saying that it's perfectly legitimate to do so. All right, trying to tone it down as well. Indeed. James Creighton, many thanks. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.